yeah, some code and benchmarks and code and benchmark. And uh, hopefully that's going to be useful for, uh, for some of you. Um, so I'm a software engineer, so engineer for Elastic in the Logstash team. So uh, Logstash is written in uh, JRuby entirely. Um, and I have two colleagues here, Guy and uh, Pere, uh, who are working uh, with me, my team, our team. Um, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, 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 fast uh, I/O or how to achieve uh, efficient um, uh, persistence uh, using uh, JRuby and Java. Uh, so this is this is work I've been I've been doing. To, um, uh, for the uh, for the actual implementation of a persisting queue, uh, I'm gonna and I'm gonna show you that uh, a little bit later on. Um, so if, if this if this is too boring for you guys, you can jump to the code right now. Uh, there's a JRubyConf 2015 uh, repo with with all the slides and the code, and the other two repos, MMAP and MMAP queues, are the actual uh, uh, MMAPing implementation and the queues implementation. Okay, so first of all, we're going to talk about uh, using data or manipulating data in Ruby. Uh, yeah, I have to hold on. So um, soon enough, you're going to be asking yourself, oh, why there's no byte array uh, in, in Ruby? Or, you know, I wish there was a byte array uh, in, in Ruby. So, in Ruby, when you manipulate data, everything uh, is is true using you know using strings actually to hold the data. And there's two important things that you have to consider when uh, when doing that, when uh, you know uh, manipulating data, is the uh, character set and encoding uh, with your strings. And if you're calling out to Java, uh, Java classes, then you have to uh, pay attention to the actual uh, type conversion that occurs between uh, Ruby, uh, JRuby, and Java. Now there's a very nice uh, wiki uh, for that that explains some of the, the pitfalls and some of the uh, the techniques that you can use to uh, uh, to get more um, uh, speed when uh, when doing that. Um, so I, I, I urge you to actually um, look at that if you ever want to uh, play with you know crossing the world between Ruby and Java. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about uh, encoding. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the details uh, for encoding. I'm going to talk about a little bit the, the Ruby side and the Java side. Um, so, so these are some of the stuff that, that you may have seen for encoding. Of course, the, uh, uh, the first line, uh, the encoding uh, for, for the Ruby files, so the, the strings that you're going to define in your Ruby files are going to be encoded uh, in, in that character set, so UTF-8 in that example. Uh, there's classes and constants uh, that you can use, uh, UTF-8, ASCII, 8-bit. And uh, this is important uh, to understand what ASCII 8-bit is. And we're going to see the equivalent in, the, in Java, which is ISO uh, 8859 uh, underscore 1. Uh, this is actually a transparent 8-bit uh, character set. So th it's, it's equivalent to saying no, no encoding, right? Um, and so main, most of the, these encoding uh, uh, methods are in the string class. So you have like force encoding, encode, um, uh, encoding, which, which is going to give you what encoding the, the string is in right now. Is it a valid encoding and, and the actual byte size of a string? Uh, so it's, inter it's, it's important to note here that the only thing that does transcoding in here is the encode method. So force encoding doesn't do any transcoding. So it only a tag for the string to tell it in what encoding it is. So I'm going to show you uh, some code that uses that. So the equivalent in, the, in Java, uh, so we have like the default character set in Java. Uh, and then there's some, some classes and constants, again, uh, for, for the, the encoding. So you have UTF-8, and then, like I said, ISO uh, 88591, uh, which is the 8-bit transparent encoding. Uh, you can set the default encoding in your Java application using the, uh, the file that encoding. Uh, you can get it uh, with the, as a property, or you know, if you're, you're from uh, JRuby, you can use the end Java file.encoding to see what the default encoding is in Java. Okay, so let, let's uh, show an example here. If I uh, define a string with uh, 
uh, uh, accent aigu or uh, acute accent uh, E. Uh, obviously, this is uh, a Unicode. A, a, a UTF-8 is going to be a two-byte encoding. So we see that the encoding here is UTF-8. If we ask the size, it's, it's a one-character uh, string. If you, we check the byte size, then it's two bytes. Uh, if we force the encoding to ASCII 8-bit, which is going to be a transparent 8-bit uh, uh, encoding, uh, we get back that, that string. And if we ask for the size, it's going to be 2, and byte size is 2. So this is to show the difference between you know, a string length and a byte size for that, str that same string. OK, uh, now let's talk about uh, object persistence. Um, so, and this is why I'm obsessing with string. It, and it's very important when we talk about uh, persistence and I.O., it's important to, to you know, uh, get the, 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 the big picture about encoding and make sure that, that you actually uh, understand that, because you may end up having you know, uh, wrong encoding and problems with that. Um, so the problem is that all Ruby I.O. uses string. So you, you don't have a choice. You have to go through strings. Um, one of the problems that we have is that <coughs> if you are uh, a JRuby object, if you want to do persistence, uh, cannot be serial it cannot implement the serializable serializable interface in Java. Uh, so you cannot benefit native native uh, serialization or really fast serialization using I don't know uh, frameworks like Cryo or stuff like that to actually serialize your object uh, within Java. Uh, this is because uh, JRuby objects actually hold references to the runtime, and and we cannot serialize that. I know that there's been some work uh, to actually be able to have serializable objects in JRuby. Uh, there's some open issues about that, but uh, it's not there today. Um, so basically, to persist an object, you need to serialize it somehow uh, to a string because you want to write it, right? So um, you can use, you could use Marshall dump, but that's the same thing. It's going to serialize to a string also. Uh, JSON, and so on. So, so you're stuck with strings. Um, so, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna play with strings, and um, we're gonna do some benchmarks with different strategies. Uh, all the code and example are gonna use a string object. So, I'm not gonna talk about serialization. This is gonna be your problem uh, to choose whatever method that you want to serialize. Um, you can talk to Guy, the author of uh, Junior Jackson here, or, or maybe uh, Satoshi for a message pack. Go see these guys. Uh, but here, for the sake of these, uh, these uh, examples, we're just going to deal with, with strings objects, string buffers, and then persist that. But of course, in the real world, you're probably going to have some serialization cost to include into these, uh, uh, these benchmarks. Sir. OK, so what's the motivation here? Um, this is, um, uh, so I work on Logstash, and uh, this is basically uh, Logstash. Uh, the Logstash pipeline is just uh, three horizontal cylinders and two vertical cylinders connected with our rows. Basically, that's it. That's a few years of software engineering right there. Uh, so we use, so these, these are the stages, the input filter and output stages in, uh, in Logstash, and they are <coughs> connected through uh, size queues. And basically, we use size queues there to actually uh, uh, propagate uh, back pressure when the outputs are slowing down. So these size queues are going to fill up. Then, then the, the, the filters won't be able to uh, push an event in there. So the, the other size queues are going to fill up, and so on. And then it's going to propagate the, the back pressure uh, back to the, uh, the, input, uh, uh, the input plugins or the input stage. Um, so the idea here is that these size queues are uh, in-memory queues. So uh, if there's a, a crash, a system crash, an application crash, or whatever, we're gonna, you're going to use all these in-flight events in, uh, in Logstash. These are smallish queues, but nonetheless, uh, this can cause a problem, right? So one of the, um, uh, uh, one of the way to, to solve that is to see, can we, can we persist those events uh, in these queues. So there, there's many solutions to that problem, but one of which is saying, okay, we're going to do um, uh, just a persistent queue implementation in right there, 
and, and that can be just a drop in replacement to the, 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 the in-memory queue, and then be done with it. It's going to be persist, and if it crashes, then when the application restarts, then you're going to read the, the persisted queue and then, and then continue on with the events. So that leads us to uh, trying to um, uh, find out the best way to persist, because log stash processes, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of events per second. So we need to be really, really fast in terms of persistence. Uh, so uh, raw IO performance, or you know, storing as many objects in, in the last time of, of, uh, of possible. And oh, uh, this is not uh, Satoshi here. Okay, so different strategies that we're going to explore. Uh, we're going to the base the base um, uh, benchmark that we're going to use is you know plain uh, Ruby file IO. Obviously, after that we're going to see uh, uh, can we do better with M mapping, so memory mapping. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to have a Java class implementation, um, and uh, we're going to test different uh, strategies to talk to the Java class. So impl implicit casting. Explicit Ruby side, Java side uh, casting. Uh, play with the character set a little bit. Uh, we're gonna build a, a JRuby extension in Java, and then have a pure uh, Ruby implementation also, and, and check the uh, the performance results. Okay, all benchmarks. Uh, basically, the, these benchmarks are for write speed only. Uh, if we have time, I'll come. We'll uh, we'll see uh, the actual queuing implementation. Which you know reads and, and writes, but these basic pe uh, benchmarks are for write speed. Uh, we're going to use a one, four, and 16k buffer buffer size. Again, these are plain uh, string buffers, uh, and we're going to be writing um, n times two gigabit two gigabyte uh, files. So the n times depends on the on the test. So I was just I just wanted to make sure that it takes long enough to get you know uh, 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 results. Uh, that are in the few second range. Uh, so this is uh, this has been run on my uh, MacBook uh, MacBook here. It has a, um, a local SSD, so of course there's a lot more IOPS than than uh, a spinning disk. Uh, latest Java and latest uh, JRuby 1.7. I haven't run the, the test on <coughs> uh, 9K yet, but uh, I'll do that. Okay, so standard uh, Ruby file IO. Um, so if you want to go in the repo and check the the implementation, I have a method there that's called bench, and it passes me a buffer and a and a write count. And and the only thing that I do, so this this bench uh, method is actually benchmarked what's happening in uh, in that block, and I'm not counting the creation of the file. Uh, so it's just going to go on, and uh, write. The, the buffer that's giving to me, so it's going to be you know 1k, 4k, 16k, and so on. So, so this is the first result that we get. This is going to be our, our base result. So we see that we have uh, you know between um, you know 680 and uh, about 900 megabyte per seconds in terms of throughput uh, with with file IO with standard file IO. Okay, so now um, an alternative is to use uh, memory mapping. So conventional file IO use read and write system calls, and uh, that involves you know, copy operation between the file system uh, pages in kernel space and the memory area in user space. So there's always copy going on. Um, but memory mapping IO uh, uses like a, a virtual memory mapping from the user space directly to the file system pages. And with a memory map file, the entire file is going to be accessed using a byte buffer class. And a byte buffer is that is you know that's it. It's a byte buffer. So you you actually manipulate your file, the underlying file, just as a, a byte array, uh, and you put bytes and get bytes. So you don't have anything uh, like like read lines or end of files or anything like that. It's just a big uh, byte array that you manipulate. Okay, so one, some of the advantages of using memory mapping. Uh, so you, you, you see the file as plain memory, like I said, as a byte buffer. Uh, there's no need to issue read or writes. Um, if you access or you get bytes from that memory space, 
there's going to be page faults um, in the OS that will bring the, f the, the, the file data from this to these, uh, these, these memory areas. So if you put bytes or you modify the memory map space, these pages are going to be marked as dirty and they are going to be flushed to disk eventually. Um, so the OS is going to be performing the caching and managing memory uh, according to system loads and available memory. Uh, one of the important things is that the data is always page aligned, so there's never buffer copying that's required. So this is, this is probably one of the biggest benefit. And also very, very large file, I think it's up to four gigabyte, can be mapped without consuming actual large amount of memory, right? Because the data is pulled in as, as, as needed. Okay, a few notes. If the user process crash, the, M the memory map file is actually intact. So because those bytes have been managed by the OS. In the pull the plug situation, well, just like a normal file, you don't know exactly, unless you've been doing uh, you know, a flush or F sync, right? The equivalent of that in, um, in, uh, with, uh, with M mapping is to use a force. So force is the equivalent of flushing and then doing an F sync. In these tests, we're not doing that. Uh, so, and this is, this is a strategy. So just like the file I.O., I've, no, I've not done any flushing or F-sync in the file I.O. test. I'm, I'm not doing any, uh, any force or flushing uh, with memory map. Um, and the performance of memory mapping is going to be relative to your file system type, the, the, the free memory that you have in your, in your system uh, for doing the file system cache, and the read-write uh, block size. Normally, M-mapping should be much faster than streaming I.O. This is what's to be expected. Okay, so first, um, we're gonna look at a simple uh, Java implementation for memory mapping. Now, I don't know if I can pull that in here. So this is a very simple implementation. So in the constructor here, we see that we, we create the file, uh, we, we, uh, we get a channel, <coughs> and then we call map, which establishes the memory mapping, or the M mapping uh, to that channel. And then the methods here are, are really uh, just a wrapper against uh, the, uh, the byte buffer uh, put and get. Um, so it's a very simple implementation. Okay, so we, yeah, we have different uh, put here that we're going to use for the different benchmarks. We're going to look at that. Okay, here we go. Okay, so the first one. Um, so using the Java class, uh, we're going to use implicit casting with the default character set. That means that we're going to pass in uh, uh, our Ruby string to a Java method that accepts a Java string, right? So we can see it. We uh, we use out that put bytes buffer. Buffer is a Ruby string, and below this is the actual method uh, Java method which accepts a string, a Java string. So, and it it gets the byte. So so uh, data that uh, get bytes, um, and and we use the buffer, uh, which is the memory map buffer. That, that's been defined, and we do a put for those bytes. As simple as that. Okay, so in this case, using m mapping, we're actually slower than file IO. And, and by a good margin. So this was a really a, what the hell is happening here? Okay, so why is it slower? It's supposed to be much faster. What's happening? Um, so the first question was, okay, is there, is there encoding, transcoding going on? Um, so let's see if we can, you know, uh, specify explicit encoding here. Um, since our string here are, de are defined as simple, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, and then we do a force encoding on, as ASCII 8-bit, so our string are already, you know, 8-bit uh, transparent, and uh, 
And, but we see that the default character set in Java is UTF-8. So OK, maybe there's transcoding going on. So instead of using the get bytes, the default get bytes, which is going to be using the default encoding in Java, UTF-8, let's use the get byte and specify our character set, which is going to be ISO 885091, uh, uh, right? So this is what we're going to do here. Instead of doing a put byte buffer, we're going to do put byte with the character set, and this is going to be passed onto Java. And there's going to be explicit character set here to avoid any transcoding. And this is what we get. So it's a little bit faster. So this is not a transcoding problem. So what's happening? Um, so of course, here we can look at you know, type conversion. Is this, is this what's happening? Um, we see that you know, we use a buffer, a Ruby buffer, and we pass it to a, a Java uh, method that, uses, that accepts a string, a Java string. So let's try and, and uh, do explicit Ruby side casting instead of you know, relying on the JRuby uh, implicit uh, type conversion. So you can see on the upper part where we, we do the, uh, the out the put bytes, we're going to do buffer to Java bytes. So this is going to pass in a byte array a Java byte array to that method. And this is going to be using below the Java implementation of put bytes, which accepts a byte array. OK, so instead of, so we do an explicit uh, Ruby side uh, type conversion. So what kind of performance do we get? Uh, it's, it's a little bit faster, especially with b bigger blocks. So at the 1K block, it's somewhat similar. And then 4K and 16K, it's getting, it's improving. Um, so this is getting interesting, right? Uh, we can see a, a, a very big increase in the 16K blocks. Um, and um, we're going to see if we can improve on that. So we're going to do, we're going to try some explicit Java side casting. So instead of doing a two Java byte, so we're going to you know, use a new method that's called put Ruby string with the buffer, with the Ruby, uh, uh, Ruby string buffer, and use and create a, a method that accepts a Ruby string object. Um, and then on that Ruby string, which is data, we're going to do a get byte list. So get byte list on the, the, the Ruby string class actually gets us a uh, byte list uh, class from which we can get the bytes. So there's two ways to getting the bytes. You can get safe bytes by doing a copy, or you can use unsafe bytes, which is going to give you a, a pointer to, you know, uh, uh, to the actual underlying uh, byte buffer for that string. So this is what we're going to do here. So OK, so this is getting really interesting. We can see that we get up to 5 gig per second uh, with the 1K block. And, and, and you know, 7 gig, 8 gig per second for the, uh, the, the 4K and 16K. This is very, very good. Uh, so, so we see that the, you know, the cost of the uh, implicit conversion in JRuby when crossing the world between JRuby and Java is very, very expensive. Um, and, uh, and there's basically two ways to avoid that from the Ruby side or from the Java side. So when you do it from the Java side, of course, you have to know a little bit more about the, the JRuby API in terms of, you know, and, and especially Ruby string. I don't know if any of you have checked the Ruby string class implementation. Uh, it's probably one of the biggest class. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing. Um, yeah. So I won't go into the details, but uh, OK, so um, now. Another implementation, so instead of doing, you know, uh, uh, talking with a plain uh, Java implementation, uh, let's try to create a, a JRuby uh, extension in Java. And, um, and so our benchmark is pretty much the same. So we're going to use, you know, put bytes and buffer our Ruby string. And then below we can see the, the uh, uh, a, a, a JRuby method defined as in Java. So there's, there's some boiler, boilerplate code in there. Uh, it's basically to check the arguments. But uh, at the arrow, you can see that we do a buffer put with uh, the actual. So we know that the Ruby object there is a Ruby string. So we can do it approximately the same thing is 
use a byte list uh, and use unsafe bytes uh, to avoid the copying of the bytes, and uh, uh, and that's it. So performance for that is somewhat similar to uh, to our explicit uh, Java that we had, but for you know a little bit faster for the 1K block. So we shave a little bit more uh, time here. Um, And uh, if we compare that to instead of using the unsafe bytes, so for me, when you do persistence, uh, I think it's it's pretty safe to use unsafe bytes because this is usually the end of the story for the string, right? You're not going to mutate the string after that. You're just saving it and you're persisting it. But if for whatever reason you, you actually want to copy those bytes to get a, a safe string to persistence, then you can do that. Instead of using uh, unsafe bytes, you can use get bytes which does a copy. And uh, the difference in performance uh, is this. So we see that it's pretty significant in terms of uh, uh, performance cost. OK, so the last implementation is a, uh, is a simply a JRuby uh, calling into Java. Uh, directly, so it's a it's a pure Ruby implementation of that uh, M mapping class that we've created, uh, you know, in Java or as a JRuby extension. And uh, basically, so the same uh, put buffer, buffer, put bytes buffer, and then below we can see the implementation. So, so there's the you know the construction. So in Ruby we're calling the the the, the actual Java class to create the the, the M mapping, and then uh, eventually we have the put bytes with data, and then we uh, we do the same, you know, data data to to Java bytes, and so on. So the performance that we get with that is, you know, pretty similar to the uh, to the explicit uh, Ruby performance. So not that good. Okay. So, uh, like I said, the uh, the motivation for that was to actually uh, implement a persisting queue. Or persisting size queue. So uh, I'm gonna take a few minutes. So I don't know how we we are with time. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna go through those slides. So this is a, a, a schema of the persistent queues uh, implementation. So there's two implementation. There's a, a you know a standard queue, um, just the same same API as the thread queue, and then there's a size queue, which are you know blocking and thread safe implementation. So they rely on um, the page handlers and the page queue implementation. So page queue is simply a non-blocking, non-thread safe, base queuing implementation that uses the page handler to do the M mapping, creating the pages and, and storing the metadata and, and so on. So those page handlers can have different strategies and there's two strategies. So there's one which called the, the, the page cache, which caches the, the, the last uh, used pages because typically you have two active pages uh, when you're doing queuing. So there's going to be the tail page and the head page. Uh, the head page is where you push, and, and these are um, append-only pages that are created. So And then there's a tail one where you actually pop the items, right? And there's the single page strategy, which is useful because in the size queue implementation, typically the number of, of items uh, you know, in the queue is small. So you can actually use the same page memory map and then just do a ring buffer in, uh, in it. So that avoids creating more and more pages, which is costly using a mapping. So this is what I just said. So typically when, when persisting data, it's just append only pages. And these pages, you can define you know, the size that you want. Uh, I'm doing, you know, and we're going to see some more benchmarks, but uh, I'm using two gigabyte pages. And uh, there's metadata, which is an MMAP file itself uh, that, that keeps pointer to what is the tail, um, you know, the tail um, uh, page index and the tail page offset. So where do we read in that page? And the same for the head for doing the push uh, on the queue. So just a word of caution. Uh, if you play with that, you know, this is work in progress and you know, proof of concept code. So obviously, uh, you should be careful. Um, again, there's no serialization involved. Uh, these tests with the queuing have been uh, done with 1K string objects only. The, the, the MMAP page size is 2 gigabyte. Uh, we use a two-item page cache, and, and uh, 
the, uh, for the test, we push two million items uh, per producer. So sometimes we have multiple producers, so that's going to be two million per producer. Okay, first, the persistent size queue. Uh, it's a limit, limited queue size. For this implementation, we use a dual queue implementation. We push to both the persistent queue and the in-memory queue. The in-memory queue is actually just an array. Um, so we serialize to push the persistence, a persistent queue, and we push the original object in memory queue, and then when we pop, we actually need to only pop from the in memory, so it avoids deserialization cost. And we just update the metadata on the persistent queue. So the persistent queue is only there if there's a crash and you need to reread the, 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 the queuing to actually uh, uh, not lose data in that case. Okay, so what do we get? Um, with page cache, we get, so we have one consumer, one producer, one consumer, two producer, two consumer, one producer, and two consumer, two producer threads uh, to try different strategies. So we pop and push uh, in those queues. So we get uh, approximately uh, 100, you know, ish uh, megabyte per second in terms of throughput with uh, a size queue. Or, you know, 100,000 uh, 100, you know, between 100,000 and 150,000 uh, transactions per second. So with a single page, we get a little bit uh, faster, uh, especially in the, the, the one consumer, one producer. Um, okay. For the, the, the persistent queue implementation, so this is not a size queue, this is a standard queue that's going to grow indefinitely uh, if, if they're the consumer are not catching up. Um, and the push and the pop operation are done, are persisted. Uh, we need to serialize on push and we need to deserialize on pop. Um, and this is essentially just a thin uh, thread safety wrapper around the page queue implementation. Okay, so for read and write, we can see that uh, we get a little bit faster. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, and so for read and write operations, so we have consumer and, uh, and producer at the same time. If we do a write then read, then we get uh, a little bit more performance. And if we do only write, then we can get up to 500 megabytes per second on only writes. Um, so just a, uh, a few notes. Uh, do we really need you know, dual queue implementation for the size queue? Is it really faster? I don't know. Uh, I need to test that. Uh, the, the caching strategy, is it optimal? Uh, can we find better page size and cache size? Um, how does that perform on spinning this? That would be interesting. I've, I haven't tested it. Um, is there a faster alternative to the, the current page and metadata algorithm that I'm using? I don't know. Uh, Got to try that. Um, and the code has, has to be reviewed in terms of resiliency. You know, doing the force, do we need to force uh, maybe at, at specific points? Um, and the last thing, you know, the elephant in the room, of course, is the serialization. There's a huge cost associated with that. So, um, again, you can talk to Guy or uh, to Satoshi about that. Um, and thank you. That's about it. <laughs>